Okay, welcome. This is the first installment of the Second Coming series. Glad you're with us tonight. We decided that uh, it would be a good idea to uh, do this series. It's a series that I did many, many years ago, uh, introducing people to preterist thinking. What is preterism? Preterism comes from the Latin word pretur, which means past. Preterism, as it relates to the eschatology of the word, means past in fulfillment. Specifically, it means that the things concerning the second coming and of Christ and all that would occur as a result of that second coming are in the past. Now, that can be shocking sounding at first. Um, don't, don't flip the dial just yet. Don't turn it off, you know, or, or, or run. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good, the scripture says. What I'd like to have you do is follow me along with your Bible as we go through what I call the Second Coming series. Now, the Second Coming series is really based uh, on all of the questions, uh, the concerns that people have spoken to me over the years. Uh, like I said, we are originally did this many years ago. It was, it was a series of CDs. I believe we've done it twice on audio CD, but this is the first time that we've ever done it on video, and we're making it available free to everybody on YouTube. So uh, feel free, please, to share this uh, with your family and friends and neighbors and this kind of thing. Hey, what a great idea. This would be a perfect time for you to put a Bible study together and uh, throw this on the TV. You could gather around the TV and Look at my happy face for the next hour or however long this takes. Originally, when we did the Second Coming series, it ended up being 17 discs or 17 teachings long. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. I'm going to kind of take my time with it. Um, I'm also thinking about adding some new material to it, things that have come along in my studies over the years. Um, and so hopefully this will be better yet than uh, the last uh, series of teachings that we've done in the past on this subject. The reason we've decided to go ahead and do this Second Coming series uh, right now is because at the moment, as some of you probably already know, we have a series called uh, a Teaching on the Book of Revelation, or Revelation 3.0, that's currently on YouTube. And uh, we're only in the second chapter right now, going through the seven churches. And what I've always said to people in the past who have asked for my CD series on the Book of Revelation, again, that's been done at least a, a couple times in the past. I've always told folks it's always wisest and best to get the preparatory teachings for the book of Revelation, get those down first. And that happens to be the second coming series. And so uh, I would suggest the same thing. If you've been watching, and of course you can, you can do what you want, but you know, you can watch uh, the book of Revelation simultaneously along with this if you want. We'll have this out uh, every week. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking right now there'll probably be one installment a week. We're not sure. We'll see how it goes. Um, but it's, uh, it's a good idea. It's a better idea that if you want to listen and go through my second, excuse me, the book of Revelation series of teachings, that you go through this second coming series first. It will really lay the groundwork for you. Now, when we talk about the Second Coming series, we're talking about what the Bible has to say about the timing and the nature of Christ's Second Coming. I'm calling it the Second Coming series because that immediately gives us a focus as to exactly what this is all about. We're talking about the timing and the nature of the Second Coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as He and the writing apostles in the New Testament expressed it some 2,000 years ago. And that expression insisted by the Lord Jesus and by the apostles was that the second coming, also known as the parousia, we'll talk about that in just a minute, would occur within the first century of the Christian experience to those contemporaries of the Lord Jesus who were living at the time of his ministry and thereafter. Essentially, we're talking about uh, what Jesus prophesied in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, as being his second coming would occur during the overthrow of Jerusalem by the Roman army with the destruction of the temple being the physical earthly sign that he had returned and that would in fact take place and did in fact take place in AD 70, the summer of AD 70, finally overthrown by the Roman general Titus. But there were two other armies that came prior to that, 
over that three and a half year long siege that took place from AD 66 to AD 70. And one of the things I, I do think I'm going to do in this series, which was not in the original Second Coming series, is I'm going to give you, I think, a verse by verse treatment through the Olivet Discourse. I think that will be imp important to do, especially as you want to understand the book of Revelation. Essentially, the book of Revelation is the flip side of the Olivet Discourse. Uh, book of Revelation is just using uh, strong Hebraic uh, themes relative to um, uh, terminology, rel relative to signifies and significations and uh, this sort of a thing. So it's really, the book of Revelation really is the flip side of the Olivet Discourse, and I'll show you that by making comparisons between the book of Revelation, the events prophesied therein, over against um, the teaching of Christ in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. In fact, I think we'll use Matthew 24 when we come to it, which won't be too long uh, from, this, from this point. Second coming series. Second coming. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, really, the Bible doesn't really use that term or that phrase, the second coming of Christ, when it refers to his second coming. <laughs> and yet we're all so used to it. We're all so used to that phrase. Um, uh, there are some folks that think, well, we should call it something else. Um, I, I don't think we should. I think we should call it what the Bible calls it. You say, well, wait a minute. Didn't you just say that not everybody says, or some people say, that the second coming is not really used in the New Testament to describe the second coming of Christ? Well, I said, that's what some people say. But it actually really is. Um, there's two good reasons to talk about this as the second coming. Number one, it distinguishes it from Christ's first coming, obviously. His first coming, born of the Virgin Mary, um, coming in humility in order to uh, bring the ministry that he did to us and to essentially die on the cross for the sins of all who would believe and then be raised again from the dead, literally, tangibly, absolutely, three days later from his crucifixion. Uh, we're talking about the difference between that coming and what was affected there and the effect of the second coming, the second coming. Now, Jesus made it very clear, and I know you probably hear this, that phrase a lot, I'll try not to use it too much. But he made it very clear that his second coming would occur to those, some of who would be alive at that time that he ministered in the first century. He stated that on a number of occasions. And we're going to look at, I, depending upon how much time it, time it takes, I have enough material to exhaust that subject. But we'll see how it goes relative to that. But, but. That second coming idea, distinguishing it from the first, sen first coming, is nevertheless still a part of the soteriological program that Christ began during his first coming. What do I mean by soteriological? Soteriology is just the, the fancy theological word for the doctrine of salvation. And really, the second coming, and what we often refer to in theological studies as eschatology, which means the study of last things, that soteriology and eschatology are bound together pretty much uh, on the same wavelength and, and have to do with the same things. Last things has to do with the wrapping up of the salvation program, which essentially we could say goes all the way back to Genesis, the third chapter, starting at verse 15, where the first giving of the gospel, the proto-evangelium, some uh, theologians call it, was given at that point, that Christ would come, would be born of a, of a woman, it would be the seed of the woman that that would crush the head of the snake, uh, the devil. And uh, we'll talk about him, of course, in regards to, to all of this. I could go back to that. It could go back from, uh, to before uh, time began. We could talk about the soteriological program all the way back uh, into eternity past, uh, where God, in his foreknowledge, and loved whom he would, and because he chose to know whom he would shed his love upon and whom he would save, that all of these things from the cross, all the events that led up to the cross, from the 40-year the period, from eight AD 30, when Christ was crucified and, and rose again from the dead and ascended all the way to AD 70, that AD 70 really is the, sum, the summing up or the closing down or the fulfilling of the soteriological, eschatological program. And the reason I said all of that in light of the idea of, yes, the Bible does call the second coming of Christ the second coming, is we take as our main text uh, for the naming of this, of this series, the second coming series, we take it from 
Hebrews 9 and verse 28, where it speaks about the fact that the writer to the Hebrews says, for those who look for him, him being Jesus, that for all those who look for him, he will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, the text says, but to bring salvation. You see how that lines up with soteriology? He, we have the speaking of the second coming occurring at the same time of him bringing in salvation. And that's not the only place in the New Testament that speaks and joins together the idea of the second coming with uh, 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 one salvation or the salvation program is what I normally call it. And so it's important to, to understand that really the second coming has an awful lot to do with the salvation program and really should be a, a primary concern for all of us who are concerned about what scripture means by what it says to know that wow, if the second coming closes, fulfills, or shuts down the soteriological program then I would really like to know when that is supposed to happen or has it already happened. People say, I'm real sure about my salvation. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins, rose again from the dead, and I confess him like Romans 10, 9 and 10 uh, says that if you believe in your heart, Jesus, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And, and I believe that. But the second coming is a part of that. It's a part of the means uh, by which your salvation is finished, and it's a part of your assurance. Now, by saying that, I am not saying that anybody uh, who is not a preterist is not saved. I'm not saying that. Let me say that again. I am not saying that anybody who is not a preterist is not saved. I am saying, however, that your assurance is drastically cut into because your salvation program has not yet been completed if you don't believe that Jesus came back in his second coming to secure salvation in AD 70 like Hebrews 9.28 says and points to. So, Enough of the introductory material. I'm going to take you through the first segment now of the Second Coming series. And the first segment, hope you got your Bible, you got something to write with, notepad, pen, paper, coffee, strong coffee. What we want to do is we want to go through this first segment right here of the Second Coming series, and it's really dealing with the parousia event, the parousia event. You say, man, you've lost me already. What the heck is a parousia? I thought we were talking about the Second Coming. Well, parousia is the Greek word that is often used in the New Testament um, to describe the Second Coming event, parousia. And the word parousia means, an, means a presence, a presence. It's an event, it's a presence, and it's really an event that brings on a consequential presence. In fact, if you looked at uh, uh, any lexicon, you will find under the, the Greek word parousia that it is an arrival with a consequential presence, an arrival with a consequential presence. Now the word is important, especially in regards to our studies. When we want to know absolutely that say Jesus or one of the apostles is referring to the second coming of Christ event, we want to know if, if that if that writer who is writing what Jesus spoke or what one of the apostles wrote, if he's using the Greek word parousia or not, if he's using the word, Greek word parousia when it comes to the context of a second coming statement, then that is the key word that we want to be able to recognize to know that in English it's often just translated as coming. That's the weakness of our English language. Um, but there are Greek words like erkomai, for instance, and its various forms that are translated as come, coming, if it's in the participle mood. And sometimes that will be used to describe a second coming event. But the context in which that word in that, in that phrase is found is absolutely everything. Context is key. You will find that a, a, a lot of what we're going to deal with here in regards to the second coming series has to do with hermeneutics. I know I'm giving you like this, like you're in some seminary, right? But hermeneutics is important to understand. Hermeneutics is the science of the method of biblical interpretation in the case in which we're 
we're using it right here. It's a method of interpretation. And one of the things we want to be really conscious of to get this subject right, like when the timing of the second coming was to be and what the consequential uh, aspects to that would be, the nature of it, what would be the consequences, the results of that second coming, we've got to pay attention to hermeneutics. One of the big areas of hermeneutics that, that, that has left us, by the way, in this position of not being able to recognize when we read our Bibles, to not be able to recognize and accept that Jesus, for instance, taught exclusively that his second coming would be to the same generation that he lived and ministered and died in, has to do with the hermeneutical concept of context. Context. Context is everything from one word up against another word to how that word is used just within a single verse or it has to do with the verse above that verse you're studying and the verse below that verse you're studying or it could be the entire chapter that you've gone through up to that point till you've reached that one verse that you're concerned about or it could be the balance of the chapter that's below that verse in particular. It could even be the entire book, an entire letter could be involved in, in this arena of context. You, and, and we'll try to point this out often as we go through these books. That's an important aspect. We also want to be paying attention to typological statements. A lot of things have gotten misunderstood within Western Christianity in England and in the United States in particular because we don't think in terms of Jewish thought speech. Jewish thought speech, metaphorical meanings uh, to, uh, to various phrases, for instance, like the term sun, moon, and stars. Anybody who has gone through enough of a study of eschatology or various forms of New Testament prophecy has come across passages in the Old and the New Testament where a reference to the sun, moon, and stars are made. We're going to find that reference, for instance, in the Olivet Discourse or in Second Peter, the third chapter. We'll read through that, and most people in the West come away with a literalistic, Greco-Roman, pedagogical, that means teaching, instruction, view that has been handed down to us into our culture, which takes things rather literally as opposed to the means by which they were originally intended as Jewish thought speech. Word pictures, sun, moon, and stars, we take that literally. So when we hear the Lord Jesus, for instance, in the middle of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, talking about the sun going dark, the stars falling from the sky, the moon turning to blood. We take that as cosmological, literal, physical meanings. Um, we see those as astronomical occurrences um, where stars are literally falling into the earth or the moon literally, if you look up at it, instead of it being nice and shiny, it's all blood red uh, and, the, and the, uh, there's some kind of a lunar eclipse going on with the sun. That's not the meaning that the Jews nor the Lord Jesus himself meant when he used phraseology like that. And in order to teach you what that means, I'm going to take you back into the Old Testament. And you're going to understand that the teaching and the phraseology of the Lord Jesus and the Jewish disciples, the writing uh, apostles, that they're using these terms and the folks that they're writing them to, many of the time Jewish people with Jewish backgrounds, they understood this picture picture graph language. Um, they didn't have to have uh, some kind of a large explanation like we in the West really do need to have. And sun, moon, and stars, when it talks about the, the, the sun going, going black and the moon turning to blood and the stars falling, things like that, is not a reference to cosmological uh, happenings or occurrences. It's something else entirely. Or another example would be something like uh, of a Hebraism um, would be uh, the new heavens and the new earth, or just the phrase, the heavens and the earth. Again, uh, because of our Greco-Roman background and pedagogy, we often take this in a literal sense. But heavens and earth, e there is a literal sense to it in certain contexts, but there's also a duple sense to it, where it's using a literalistic uh, type of uh, language and conveying further thought 
taught to us through picture a graph sort of explanations in regards to the meaning of the heavens and the earth. Heavens and the earth is not always physical. I will t show you in the Old Testament and as the apostles used it in the New Testament how that that phrase often, more often, had to do with teaching. It had to do with covenants. It had to do with covenants between nations. It had to do and was used by the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament writers as the difference or a way to explain the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I will also demonstrate to you, and I will bring the, these, the, the, the history books in too. You'll see them right next to me, and I'll read out of them to you where uh, historians, Jewish historians, use, for instance, the common phraseology of the heavens and earth to describe the temple in Jerusalem. There's a lot to this. And you can see already just by this little bit of intro, and I haven't really proved anything to you yet. There's no reason for you to believe what I'm saying. Uh, you need to listen and you need to insist that I give you evidence and proof. That's what this is all about. But you can already see that if I can prove these things to you and demonstrate them to you from Scripture, first and foremost, then from secondary uh, pieces of historical work, that doesn't this tend to drastically change our understanding of the, of the way we interpret scripture relative to eschatology, relative to the second coming, relative to the events that surround the second coming? I'd say so, and I think you probably agree with me. Back to this word parousia now. The word parousia shows up in the Greek New Testament 24 different times, 24 different times. 17 out of those 24 times, 17, they're directly used in the context of the second coming descriptors, the second coming. So you can see already that that's an important word to know and to be able to recognize when you're going through your English Bible, you ask yourself the question, you come across the word coming, uh, then you ask yourself the question, I wonder if this is the Greek word parousia, which means an arrival with a consequential presence, an arrival with a consequential presence. Because you see, that's key in regards to preterist understanding of the scripture. When Jesus said he would come back, he wasn't going to come back, bounce off the planet like some sort of a yo-yo, pick up a bunch of people in the so-called rapture, which is not a biblical teaching, sorry. We'll cover that too, and I'll show you where that that teaching came from. And he's not going to bounce off the planet's surface in the second coming, scoop up a bunch of believers and haul them back to heaven. The Bible teaches that nowhere. Um, but if you have a presupposition towards that, a presupposition towards that, or towards any kind of a meaning presupposed upon the text, you will end up interpreting the text in accordance with your prejudice every time because the presupposition leaves you in a state of prejudicial judgment. Prejudicial judgment. We'll talk about presuppositions because they play an awful lot in ruining our right understanding of Scripture. There are some presuppositions that are right on to have, but they are the result of good exegetical study. One presupposition that's important to have when you pick up your Bible is that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, that he was literally, tangibly, absolutely raised from the dead. Those are solid biblical presuppositions. Why do I say that that's a solid presupposition? Because it's gone through the aspects of exegesis and it has been tested over and over and over again through, uh, through strong hermeneutical methodology and so on, grammatical methodology, so on and so forth, comparative analysis, and it's what the Bible means by what it says. Just a couple of examples. When you come to the, as, the idea of the second coming, the second coming has not gone through that same type of, type of rigorous testing. The subject of the second coming has not gone through the same type of rigorous testing historically. Know what I mean by that? What I mean is this, is that from the third century forward, just before some of the major ecumenical councils began to, to take place within Christendom and various synods would gather together to discuss and deal with various uh, upsetting doctrines. Maybe it's Arianism uh, in the fourth century. Um, maybe, and that would be the, the false teaching that says that uh, from a man named Arius that says that the Lord Jesus was not really God uh, in the flesh. And so what would happen is that the Christians would come together 
together in council from various parts of the Roman Empire and spend many months, sometimes years, studying the scriptures, debating it, going through painstaking exegesis to arrive at what the Bible means by what it says. Strong work had been done, and then it was tested and retested and retested by following generations and men like us who stand on the shoulders of those who go before them. And we retest all of that information. See, just because a synod or a council has come together and spoken to a subject and reached a conclusion on it doesn't necessarily mean that they're right and that they're golden and that they don't need to be tested. No, the Bible standard remains the same generation to generation to generation. Test all things, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, hold fast to that which is good. In, which case, in other words, testing those things, interpreting those things, applying uh, the aspects of hermeneutic, uh, uh, Greek and Hebrew, uh, grammatical, lexicographical uh, information, um, testing it, comparative analysis, and so on and so forth, comparing scripture with scripture. And then we arrive at the right understanding. Now this has been done for all of the major doctrines in the New Testament. Because you'll find if you study through church history, if you study through, yes, we're on the second coming series, this is all a part of it. There's no rabbit holing going on right now, this is intentional. If you study through church history, nearly the last 2,000 years of the history of the church, you'll find out that the bulk of church history is about a correcting wayward thinking and errant doctrines that were within the church at that time. Sometimes individuals who were later branded as heretics um, were the ones who brought these, these wayward doctrines in. But every time uh, something would come up, maybe it would be about uh, the humanity or the divinity of Christ, a question would come up. Maybe somebody was teaching something errant about the nature of the Godhead relative to the Trinity being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe it had to do um, with the... Uh, uh, with the inspiration, integrity, and authority of the scriptures themselves. And so every time this type of thing would come up, some section, some individual doctrine, then the church would, would go to town on it. They would take it up as a task, and there would be representatives from all over the church, all over Europe, essentially the Roman Empire, uh, as we go through these various ecumenical councils. They would come together, spend months, sometimes years, uh, studying the scripture and debating the subject and coming to a conclusion. I would say most of the time their, collusion, their conclusions are exegetically upright and correct, but that doesn't mean they, they were perfect every time. Now you say, okay, what does this have to do with the Second Coming series? Well, just this. That type of hard work coming together in synod, in council, to deal with a subject like the timing of the Second Coming, the subject of eschatology, the study of last things. Do you know which council and which synod came together to discuss that and settle that in church history? None of them. That's right. It's never been done. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm pretty sure I read my Nicene Creed or my Athanasian Creed and right down near the bottom right there, it says we believe that Jesus the Messiah will come again in glory. And I, I think, yes, they did tag that belief at the end of their documents, but they did not study through that subject. All they were doing was making a statement of faith that they believed up to that time. What they would often do is they would take in the New Testament, the Gospels and the Epistles, and they would take the yet future to them statements, future to them, those recipients of the New Testament writings, like the Romans, like the Corinthians, like the Philippians, so on and so forth. And what the writers of the, of the creeds and confessions would do is they would take these writings and they would see, of course, the writings all speak about Christ coming in the future. But all of these books in the New Testament were written prior to A.D. 70. That's another good subject that one needs to jump into as well. The, the dating of these books is very important. I'm convinced, as one who has studied these things thoroughly, that all of them were written prior to A.D. 70. All of them were. All the Gospels and all uh, of the Epistles. Um, J.A.T. Robertson believed that. Um, a number of, of uh, strong exegetical, exegetical historical men uh, believe that uh, in regards to, to these things. Uh, 
And so what we've got here is the creeds and confessions as they were written by men. They would take the yet future to them, to the Romans, to the Philippians, statements that were made. And they would just assume, assume that because Jesus had not come back yet in the way that they understood it through a Greco-Roman mindset, the world blows up and Jesus returns, yes? That because those types of things had not occurred yet, that Jesus has not, in fact, come back. It couldn't have happened because nobody saw a six-foot-tall Galilean carpenter in the clouds above. And isn't that what Jesus said men would see? No, it isn't, as a matter of fact. We'll get to that. But the Bible says that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth when Jesus comes back. And this is the same old heavens and the same old earth. Ah, but see, there's your presupposition that's working against you right there in regards to the meaning of new heavens and new earth. Now, some of you are going, ooh, man, I don't know. This is making me real nervous, you know. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you want to shut this off, you can shut this off as soon as I say this. Okay, ready? Just hang on and listen to this one thing. If you don't like what I'm going to say right now, and what I'm going to say right now doesn't make any sense to you, click that thing off. John MacArthur, Van Impey, they're all ready to, to serve up some hot steaming dispensational futurism for you. It's already cooking and it's on the stove. Here's what I want to say to you if you're nervous about some of the things I'm saying. And that's this. Isn't it, your, uh, isn't it your obligation to not just walk away or run away from something like this? I'm laying down some pretty strong statements and some definite challenges here. But isn't it your obligation to test all things? Hold fast to that which is good? Where is the integrity of exegeting the scriptures in good hermeneutical fashion, in good grammatical trained fashion? Where is the integrity? If you... If you don't believe uh, in what I'm saying, that's okay. But make sure you know why you don't believe. Don't be emotional about it. Don't be emotional about it. Emotion gets you nowhere. Emotion gets you nowhere. As opposed to all that, let's dig into the scriptures themselves and see what the Bible has to say about these things in particular. Why is it that there has never ever yet in our time of church history, why has there never been a synod, a council of some sort that is gathered together to deal with this subject, to actually sit down and study through this subject? That that would be a council that would that would take years to deal with, even though our communication techniques have gotten massive, of course. But I mean, it would take a long time because the opinions of men from transdenominationally, interdenominationally, and uh, uh, non-denominationally have all grown to such a great degree. There's three different kinds of millennial views, maybe four out there right now. Which one is correct? They can't all be correct. There's only one millennium that is expressed in Scripture. Somebody's wrong. Maybe somebody's right. Maybe everybody out there is wrong. There's different views in regards to the timing of the second coming, which some people line up with the so-called rapture. There's pre-trib. There's mid-trib. There's post-trib. Which one is correct? And how do you know that the one you're holding to is correct? Maybe you're the one with the presuppositional problem. Maybe your neighbor who holds something different from you has got a presuppositional problem. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one right teaching. Do you know how many views of justification by faith there are in the Bible? One. There's only one. You know why? Because the synods and councils prior to this went to work on that, studied it through, and came to that conclusion. And then we stand on their shoulders checking their work since then. And we stand up boldly and say, there's only one view of justification by faith. How many different views are there in regards uh, to sanctification? How many different views are there in regards to the person of the Holy Spirit? See, now we get into uh, some fuzzy areas, don't we? But the church has spoken to these things. When I say the church, I'm talking about those who have studied these things in synodical councils and so on and so forth. And it requires your attention. It requires my attention. You don't, just, you don't just take what other people have studied and swallow it down. You put it to the test. You take their work and you put it to the test. There are systematic theologies out there 
There's Burkauer that's out there uh, and others like that that actually state in their systematic theologies in regards to this subject that perhaps at some point in the future, writing about the 50s, uh, perhaps sometime in the future there will finally be a synodical council called together where this subject of eschatology will finally be worked out. It hasn't happened yet. And that's why there are so many different views in regards to that. How do you know preterism is not true? If you're a preterist and you say it is true, my question is the same back to you. How do you know that it is true? You have to be able to make a defense, Jude 3 says, for the faith that was once for all given to the saints. The phrase the faith means everything that the Bible teaches that is to be believed. And you're called to make an apologia. That's not an I'm sorry. An apologia means a defense. A defense of the faith. Can you defend it? Can you defend what you believe the Bible teaches? Because Christ is not glorified by Christians who just stand out there and say, well, I'm not sure. You all better get sure. You better get sure real fast. Because I will guarantee you the majority of people that would reject some of the things that I'm saying to you right now, the majority of people out there can't make a defense for what they believe either. And if you're getting upset right now, then I guess I'm talking to you. But you don't have to be that way. Christ is glorified when we glorify him with all of our spirit, soul, mind, and strength. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that we have the mind of Christ. You know what that means? That means simply that you have the potentiality uh, of knowing what Christ knows relative to what has been revealed in the scriptures. That's ultimately what that means. The second coming series, the aspect of the Parousia, 17 times it shows up. An arrival with a consequential presence. Do you know there's, there's one passage, and we'll come back to this at, a, at another point. But there is one passage you could flip to with me right now in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John and the 14th chapter, the first three ver verses. There is one passage in particular that does not use the word parousia when it discusses the parousia or the second coming, but it does, it does define for us um, in, uh, in three verses the essential uh, lexical meaning of parousia, which is a, an arrival with a consequential presence. And that's John 14, first three verses. Jesus says, do not, he's speaking to the boys, I call the apostles the boys, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Listen to this. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. Listen now. I go to prepare a place for you. So he's, he hasn't gone to the cross yet. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to be raised from the dead. Forty days later, what's he going to do? He's going to ascend. So I go to prepare a place for you, yes? I go to prepare a place for you, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, listen, I will come again and receive you to myself. Do you have any problem with understanding the I will come again to be a reference to the second coming? He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I wonder if there are other passages that speak about Christ coming back and receiving believers unto himself. I think we could probably find a few. But uh, even if you disagree with me, accept my, what I'm saying just for the moment if you would. Give me, the, uh, give, me the, give me the advantage. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Now we're talking about parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence. Look at the bottom of verse 3. That where I am... There you may be also. Now you read that very carefully, and of course you ought to be able to see that if he comes back, and that's a reference to the second coming, and I believe it is, and he says, I receive you unto myself. People want to say that's the rapture. We'll cover that. But that's not the point at the moment. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am. Stop. Well, if he comes again, where is he? He's here, isn't he? Yeah. He's here. So if I come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, here, you may be also. Where? Here. That's parousia, folks. That's an arrival with a consequential 
presence. How about that? So right away, for those uh, out there who may believe that the second coming involves Jesus coming down, collecting all of his church in some kind of a rapture, and then taking them back to heaven for seven years while hell is unleashed down here. That's the popular dispensational view. That's the youngest view on the block, by the way, when it comes to the historical views of interpreting um, scripture relative to the second coming. But for those who hold on to that, right away you've got a problem with this passage, don't you? It doesn't work for that. It doesn't work for Jesus coming down, collecting you, and leaving. This is not a holy yo-yo moment or something like that. Jesus is not coming down, grabbing up as many, like you're playing jacks or something. And you bang the ball and you grab your little starry jacks and you grab, try to grab the ball again as you lift your hand up. That's not what's going on right here. So this, this passage right here teaches the, the essential meaning of parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence. Now what I want to do is I'd like to take you through some passages right now. As we deal with this word, the parousia, that's why I'm calling this session here the parousia event. And as we go through these passages, you'll see in your English Bibles, unless you can read Greek and you've got a Greek uh, New Testament, that's great. Um, I'm using a New American Standard uh, uh, to teach uh, you today. But as we go through these passages, you'll see the word come or coming or something like that. Um, cometh, if you've got a King James uh, version. And, and I want you to start getting used to writing maybe next to that word, under that word, maybe in your margin. Uh, the English word parousia, you can just transliterate it into, into English, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, -S that will do it, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, -S parousia, okay, and don't forget to write down that definition, an arrival with a consequential presence, you see when Jesus comes back in his parousia, he stays. He doesn't go anywhere. And of course, eventually where this is going to lead is I'm going to show you all the scriptures that speak about the fact that he stays. And you'll come to the conclusion all by yourself. Some might see me as, as peppering it a little bit right now. But you're going to come to the conclusion all by yourself as you go through this that Jesus has been here for the last 2,000 years. And that means something has been going on for the last 2,000 years. And that means there has been a new heavens and a new earth for the last 2,000 years. Don't shut it off yet. Uh, you got to test this. And I'm going to be dealing in detail with all of these subjects. Maybe it'll be 17 weeks. Maybe it'll be 70 weeks. I don't know. There's a lot of things I have to say, and there you go. But you can always turn it off and come back and watch it and listen to it at some later time. Let's first talk about the parousia in Matthew's Gospel. Slip over to Matthew 24 with me. Matthew 24. And really, it's verse 3 where the word parousia shows up in the Greek text. Parousia in the Greek text. Matthew 24, verse 3. Let's read verse 3 first, and then we'll get back into some context. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming? That's parousia in Greek. Of your arrival with a consequential presence, and of the end of the age. Now, they ask him two questions there, essentially, don't they? Now, according to Mark 13, Mark's uh, version of the Olivet Discourse, we've got four of the disciples here on the mount with Jesus. You've got Peter, James, John, and Andrew, four of them. And he is speaking directly to them. One of the things you're going to want to be noticing, and we're not going to do it right now, but, but at a later time, you're going to want to be noticing, but you can do this, by the way, by yourself, reading through Matthew 24, is all the places where you see the word you, or if you have a King James, it would be ye, Y-E, okay? That's a second person plural pronoun in Greek. Second person plural. And it's addressing those whom he has got in front of him right there. Or rather, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. It's going to be important to understand that because he's going to say throughout the Olivet Discourse that it is you guys, it is you fellows right here that are going to experience and or see some of these things or some of them would see all of these things. John in particular is going to live all the way through past A.D. 70 and Jesus is going to back that up by the way by prophesying that in John the 21st chapter where he says to, to Peter, if it is my will for John, 
who is standing there, for him to remain until I come back or until I return? What is that of your business? You just follow me. And he's going to say that twice, and we'll cover that uh, as well. Isn't that kind of interesting right there that he told John that he was going to remain until he came back? So that means either John is holed up in a cave somewhere, a little old and a little ripe at this point, or... Or, Jesus came back during John's lifetime, and I would recommend you think on those terms, because that's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27, and 28. That's for another time. All right, so let's get a little bit of context right here. In chapter 23 of Matthew, he's, uh, he's lamenting verse 37 over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her off, and I would gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling verse 38 behold your house your house is left being left to you desolate for I say to you if from now on you will not see me until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and of course that's what the people and the children were were crying um, when Jesus was coming down from the Mount of Olives, uh, the so-called triumphal entry, riding on the donkey as Zechariah 9.9 prophesied, and the people were crying out various portions of Scripture out of Psalm 118 because they did that during the Passover, and these were Messianic passages, and one of them was, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Some of the children were even crying that out in the temple when Jesus went into the temple and whatnot. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, all right? So it says, verse 20, uh, chapter 24, verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple. He had just gotten through dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites, right, in chapter 23, and telling them that their house in 2338 was going to be left to them desolate. The house is not the house of Israel here. It's a reference to their temple as the house. Let me prove it to you. Chapter 24, verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple, right? Take your pencil and go from the word temple back up to chapter 23, verse 38, where you see the word house. Connect them. Connect them. That'll be helpful for you. I will often tell you to do that, and it's up to you if you want to write in your Bible or not, but that's what we do here at Messiah. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. What disciples were these? Well, that would be Peter, James, John, and Andrew, right? Because that's what it says in Mark 13. So we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. Only Mark 13 gives us that information, all right? Verse 2, and he, Christ, said to them, do you not see all these things? Now, why does he say that to them? Because bottom of verse 1, when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, Mark 13 says that, that they were talking about how wonderful the buildings were. How could Jesus be saying that the house, Matthew 23, 38, would be left desolate? Look at how beautiful it was. You have to understand that the temple was the premier statement, physical statement, about Judaism. I mean, it was gaudy. You talk about gaudy, it was gaudy. Uh, we have historical uh, information that talks about the fact that from miles away, if travelers were on their way to Jerusalem, they could actually see the temple with its white glistening domes and its parapets and gold all around the various uh, uh, parapets and the walkways uh, just shining in the desert heat of that sun, sparkling. I mean, it was a, really quite a thing. When Herod uh, had been, Herod the Great had been rebuilding the temple to a great degree in order to ingratiate himself towards the Jews is really why he was doing it. But the temple was some 38 years being built, um, and it's going to just be finished just by a couple of years before Nero sends in uh, General Cestus Gallus with the first Roman wave of Roman armies right there to begin to take over Jerusalem in the summer of A.D. 66. And just a couple years after that, by about August of A.D. 70, that temple will be burned to the ground after it had only been finished, really, for just a very few years. So Jesus comes out of the temple, verse 1, was going away when his disciples come up to point out the temple buildings to him. And they're, they're saying to him, essentially, how can you say this? Look at how beautiful this is, how wonderful, how expensive, you know, and how solid. It's like it's going to last forever. Jesus wants to make sure that all of their pride and 
all of their, all that they put into this temple and how important they thought it was. It really was the idol of Judaism. That this is all coming down. And he says in verse 2, and, and he said this to them, do you not see these things? The, the temple. Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Interesting little side information right there. The Roman army, once they, once they burned down the temple, they breached the walls of Jerusalem and got inside, that for many, many weeks thereafter, they were pulling up the various stones, the pavings uh, 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 around the temple because the intense heat of the temple itself burning down and all of that gold that was in the temple and on the temple, all of that gold melted and went down between the cracks. And this is something that the Roman soldiers were allowed to do. They could take whatever they wanted and they were prying up. They were bringing in the machinery and prying up these huge blocks of stone. Some of those blocks of stone are still visible in, in uh, Jerusalem today, as a matter of fact, off to one of the sides of the walls right there. But in any case, they would pull them all up. So literally fulfilling what Jesus said right here, that not one stone in the end of verse 2 uh, will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now verse 3, and he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him, and this is what's on their mind. They're believing what Jesus says. Jesus said, this thing is coming down. So right away, the beginning of the context of the Olivet Discourse, and this will be important for you to remember later, has to do with this temple. Has to do with this temple being torn down. And it's directly going to be used by Christ as he moves through this Olivet Discourse to talk about and point out that when this happens, when you see this happen, then you'll, that's the timing of my coming. You know what? I'm going to give you a little taste, Okay. Flip the page and look at, look at verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, and I will show you that the tribulation of those days is in reference to the, uh, uh, the siege on Jerusalem from AD 66 to 70. The tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, remember this, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky or the heavens, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and when the... And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in, literally, the heaven, Urano. Uh, it doesn't say the Son of Man would appear, but the sign of the Son of Man would appear in the heavens or in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven heaven with power and glory. That's exactly what Jesus is going to say in Matthew 26, 64 to the members of the Sanhedrin when he's standing in front of them during his mock trial and he is going to say exactly that. I am the son of man or the son of God and you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And then they rent their robes and they said he has blasphemed because they under the Jewish understanding is that only God comes in the clouds. See, when this text says that you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, it's in light of what he said earlier in verse 30, context, that the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. And I'm going to show you when we get into this context that that sign has everything to do with that temple coming down, with that temple being destroyed. And Jesus saying not one stone would be left standing until it all comes down. And then it says, and he will send forth... His angels with a great trumpet, they will gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of the sky or the arano, uh, to the other. Now watch this. He gives a parable of the fig tree. Then he says in 33, so you too when you, now that's your second person plural, when all of you see all these things. Wait a minute. Would you agree with me that verse 30 and verse 31 is talking about the second coming? Would you agree with that? I think most people probably would. So he says in 33, after he has said about the second coming, so that all of you too, when all of you see all these things, all these things, so he's saying they would see this. They would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. They would see the destruction of the temple. They would see the sun, moon, and the stars and the effects that was going on. Not some later group, that group. What group? The ones he was talking to. Peter, James, John, Andrew. 
I know, John saw it. Keep going. When you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say unto you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The Greek word right here for generation is genia. It means one's contemporaries. One's contemporaries. It's not genos, which can also be translated as generation, which usually has to do with a family or a tribe or a people group. Genia can be used that way in certain contexts, but genia is the only Greek word that has uh, the, uh, the special meaning of one's contemporaries. And so it makes sense. Jesus using the second person plural pronoun. Peter, James, John, Andrew are standing right there. Jesus has already been saying in Matthew 16, uh, 27 to 28, uh, that the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward every man. And I say unto you that some of you, some of you, some of you that are standing here when Jesus is talking, saying this in the first century, that some of you standing here will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom with power. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you relax it really does mean exactly what you've always thought it meant. It really does. Let's just keep going. I know the collisions are happening. It's okay. It's all right. This is an act of grace that's taking place right now. And, uh, you know, when the baby comes, it's fabulous. But up until that moment, Sorry about the pain. Let's keep moving here. He says, this generation, verse 34, will not pass away. These, my contemporaries, will not pass away until all these things take place. So that's exactly what he said in Matthew uh, 16, 27, and 28. Some of you standing here will not taste of death till you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's the same thing. It's just different words. Meaning is the same. Then he says, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Remember what I told you at the very beginning? I'm going to show you the meaning. I'm going to show you the text. Heaven and earth would pass away, meaning what, 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 what was he talking about that would be passing away in the context of the Olivet Discourse? What does he start off with? It's the passing away of the temple, isn't it? Yeah. Not one stone would be left upon another. In fact, in verse 15, he even says, Therefore, when all of you see, Peter, James, John, Andrew, when all of you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You know, you want to know what that means? It doesn't mean you need to make a trip to Daniel. <laughs> it means you need to write down Luke 21, verse 20, to get the meaning. Because Luke 21, verse 20, Luke 21 is Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse. And in the exact same context that you're seeing here, in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, that after they see this abomination that makes desolate, what do they do? Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains? Well, in Luke 21, 20, it doesn't say, see the abomination of desolation. It says, when all of you shall see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Exact same context. But the wording... The wording is, is interpretive, isn't it? The wording is interpretive. Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus, a Gentile. It would do Theophilus no good whatsoever, who, who it, it appears through, through Luke's gospel, did not have a, a whole lot of an understanding in regards to Jewish type and metaphor terminology. Would he have known what the abomination of desolation was referring to? Well, it's talking about that which desolates and abominates that which is holy. Guess what? The, the Roman army come in under Cestus Gallus. Basically, they take over the city. They have the whole city under their control. And they come in through the gates and they begin setting up their banners. All of their banners have various gods and false gods and goddesses on it. And they begin offering incense, doing oblation, worship uh, to their gods right there in the precincts of Jerusalem. They are desolating the holy place. They are abominating the holy place at that moment. And guess what happened? History tells us, Tacitus, for instance, and Josephus both tell us that for some inexplicable reason, 
Didn't Jesus say right here, when you see this happen, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, whoever is on the housetop. Don't go down to get your things out of the house, who's ever in the field. Don't go back to get your, your cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant, those who are nursing in, the, in those days, so on. This great tribulation, so on and so forth. Guess what happened? Jesus said, get out. He said it in Luke 21 also. He said, run. And so for some inexplicable reason, we don't know why, Cestus Gallus pulled back his army. Pulled it back. And all of the Christians recognizing that this is what Jesus said because they were looking for this. They knew that they were the generation that was going to see this. They were looking. And all of the Christians that lived in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area around Judea left. They headed north to Pella. And that's a historical fact. There was not one Christian, not one Christian that was left, as far as we can tell, within the precincts, within the walls of Jerusalem or in Judea for that matter. And then Cestus Gallus began to close in ranks again. Vespasian, General Vespasian would come after that with another Roman army. And then for the last five months, there would be Vespasian's son, Titus, whom Vespasian, who would become uh, Caesar at that point, because Nero is going to die. But Nero started all of this. And then Vespasian is going to assume the purple. And then he's going to send his son, Titus. And for the last five months, Titus is just going to beat on Jerusalem. You know what's going on inside of Jerusalem? Hell is unfolding inside of Jerusalem. Men and women are killing each other inside of Jerusalem. It is absolute mayhem. They've run out of food. There's no clean water left to drink. They're eating each other. Cannibalism is being practiced. Just like Moses prophesied would happen at the destruction of Jerusalem in Deuteronomy 28. But I digress. We're talking about the parousia. See how all of these things challenge our presuppositions? And I'm just saying, look at what a little bit of reading in history does. Look at what paying attention to context does. Look at what um, getting an education in hermeneutics does. Instead of treating these terms, oh, and by the way, by the way, remember what I told you about the heavens and the earth? What does it say in verse 35 of Matthew 24? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. What has he been talking about that would pass away at the very beginning of the Olivet Discourse? The temple. And I'm going to bring documented information in, and I'm going to re show it to you right online here. I'm going to read it right to you of why we know that the term heavens and earth was a popular, normal term that was used in the first century to mean the temple and the old covenant as it was expressed in the temple in particular. But that verse 3 right there, verse 3 right there, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They want to know what will be the sign of his parousia. Remember, this is the same group of guys that Jesus spoke to in John 14, verses 1 through 3. Remember, I had you look at it, right? I had you look at it. We're in, in John 14, uh, 1 through 3. Uh, you know, you believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house are, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place as a tapos for you. By the way, the word tapos right there means an office. Yeah, it means an office. It means a place of responsibility. I go to prepare a place of responsibility for you. And if I go, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, you will be also, well, here he says right here at the bottom of three, they ask him, tell us when will these things be and what would be the sign of your arrival with a consequential presence and the end of the age. They're not asking him when he's coming back to beam me up Scotty, the church, off the planet's surface. They're not asking him anything like that. That's completely foreign to their understanding. They understand that parousia here, an arrival with a consequential presence, is, is the idea is taken from John 14, 1 through 3. And that's why they're using the word parousia right here. Because that describes his arrival with his presence. He stays. And when he stays, the end of the age comes. I'll tell you what the end of the age means. I'll show it to you in Scripture. It's not what you've been told it means. We'll go through the phrase last days, last time, the last hour. Aren't you kind of tired of people asking you, do you think we're in the last days? 
Do you think this is the last hour? And now, why is it, by the way, why is it, by the way, that every generation for the last two 2,000 years has been trained to think in the church that they are the generation that will see the second coming. Why is that? Somebody has said somewhere along the way that, that somebody's made up their mind at some point that this is the meaning that Jesus wants us to all be receiving. That we're all supposed to think that we are the generation that's going to see the second coming, that we're supposed to be living with that type of an outlook. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not biblical. That is made up. That is a lie. That is not true. You've been lied to. There's only one second coming. The Bible said that there would be only one generation that could expect his second coming. That was the first century generation. Conversely, there is absolutely no scripture anywhere, Old or New Testament, that says Jesus is coming back any time outside of the first century. None. But I got nothing but scriptures, which I will show you, that in fact say that. I'm even going to give you a few right now. Are you tired? Hit pause if you need to go get a sandwich or something like that. Maybe get some coffee or I, I don't know. You know, I, I can't hit pause. I'm stuck. How much time we got, brother? Almost an hour. I got, I got an hour left to go? Almost. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, 55 minutes. So I'm good? I got another hour? Sure. Let's hit it. We're in Matthew 24. We're studying the parousia. Parousia. I'll just give you a few more and we'll quit. Because, you know, day with the Lord says a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, blah, blah, blah. Verse 27 of Matthew, the 24th chapter. Verse 27. I've already touched on this to you to some degree. But let's keep looking. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man weep. That's parousia. So will his arrival of his consequential presence be. When he comes, he stays. Matthew 24, verse 27. How about Matthew 24, verse 37? For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like it was in the days of Noah. Coming, parousia. That's parousia right there, arrival of the consequential presence. How about verse 39 of the same chapter? Speaking of Noah entering into the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all the way, so will the coming parousia of the Son of Man be. And by the way, some people try to take um, really verse, um, verse 36 in Matthew 24 all the way through really to chapter 25, and they try to make this a division within the Olivet Discourse. There are folks out there known as partial preterists, which just, I don't know how you can be a partial preterist any more than you could be a partial human being. Of course, there are some people out there that are only partial men or partial women, I suppose. But you see my point. Um, there's no such thing as a partial preterist. There's just preterism. Um, you'll, know that, you'll notice that there are phrases out there that are running around uh, like full preterism. Um, I don't want to get into all of that right now. I don't want to get into those types of terms. I am a preterist. Uh, I add nothing further uh, to that. Let's just keep reading right here. Keep noticing these places where the word parousia shows up. How about uh, we'll leave Matthew 24 and you look at 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And uh, it's verse 23 that's got the word, but let's get some context now. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 20 with me. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep, those who have died. For since by man came death, that would be Adam, right? By man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Being made alive means being raised. But he's stating this as a matter of fact. He's not explaining it yet. This is one of those fact statements concerning the resurrection, not a nature statement. It doesn't explain what he means by resurrection. It just gives the fact of it. He, he holds on that until later in the, in the chapter. But, but look at verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. after that, those who are Christ's win at his parousia. So it's, it's when the parousia occurs that the resurrection occurs. Now this is very important. Christ's arrival with a consequential presence occurs 
along with the resurrection. It is coterminous with the resurrection. And that's going to be important to understand because I'm forcing this on us right now. If, in fact, the New Testament teaches that the second coming parousia would be in the first century, then ergo, this resurrection has to be in the first century as well. I have a teaching to give you in regards to the resurrection. I will demonstrate for you that it did, in fact, happen, and it's still happening. But let's keep going. After you look at 1 Corinthians 15, slip over to 1 Thessalonians with me. 1 Thessalonians... It's the beginning of the, uh, the T books in the uh, New Testament epistles. You know all the T's are together. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. 1st, 2nd Timothy, 1st, 2nd, excuse me, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. All the T's are together, okay? So here's a group of people that were aware and were being encouraged by the Apostle Paul to look for the second coming to happen in their lifetime. And he's very strong about this. And I want you to ask yourself a question. Why was the apostle so strong about that? And where did he get that idea? Well, he got it from not the other apostles. He got it from the Lord Jesus. Because Galatians, the first chapter, says that everything that he got, he got directly from the Lord Jesus. He didn't get this gospel from some apostle or something like that. But he was teaching the same things that the apostles were teaching, the other apostles were teaching, relative to the subject of the second coming. As a matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10, he tells them that they have been waiting for his son. Let's back it up to 9. For they themselves... Uh, report about uh, to us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. They are actively waiting for his son from heaven, along with turning from uh, idols to the living God through faith in the gospel. That's your context right here from verse 8 all the way down through 10. So just like they had turned expectantly to the gospel, they had turned to wait expectantly for the Son from heaven. Is that a fair understanding of that? I don't think anybody should have too much of a problem with that if you're looking at this, hopefully correctly. Now look at the second chapter of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and look at 19th verse. 19th verse. For who was our hope or our joy or our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming, at his parousia? There it is. What happens at the parousia, by the way, according to 1 Corinthians 15:23? The resurrection happens. It's coterminous with the parousia. It's got to happen simultaneously with that. I just want you to notice these parousia passages. Chapter 3 and verse 13. Chapter 3 and verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the parousia of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. So all of the saints are established in holiness at the parousia. Are they not? Sure they are. Remember when Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse that when he comes back, then he sends forth his angels to the four corners or the four winds of the earth to gather his together, his elect unto himself? I want you to understand and begin to think in terms, biblically, and I'm going to show this to you, in regards to this gathering together, that it's, it's far beyond those. The Bible's going to teach, and I'm going to show it to you, where it's that gathering together is far beyond those who were on the surface of the earth at that time. That this gathering together, and it's episunagoge, it means to synagogue together, to worship together, to synagogue together, episunagoge. The epi in front of it intensifies the word. So he comes back, he sends forth his angels, he episunagoges all of his saints, his elect he calls them. This is a parallel passage to that right there. That he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. That's the episunogoge that takes place. And the episunogoge already happened. You were gathered as a believer in Christ. You were gathered to him in AD 70. I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. Let's do some more. Parousia passages. How about 1 Thessalonians 4.15? 1 Thessalonians 4.15. This will blow your chops away. 
He says, for this we say unto you, that's a plural right there, all of you, all of you Thessalonians. So he's writing to the Thessalonians, isn't he? Writing to the Thessalonians. This is another hermeneutical value, okay? Audience relevance. Maybe you've heard that term before. That's a good term. Uh, we are reading somebody else's mail when you're reading the New Testament documents. The New Testament, Matthew all the way through to Revelation, these, these documents were not written to you and I in the year 2013, were they? They weren't written to you, were they? They were preserved for you by God's Spirit, sure. The letters, the Gospels were preserved, but they were not written to you. They were written to real flesh and blood people who actually lived in Rome in the first century, who actually lived in Philippi, who lived in Ephesus and Thyatira. Uh, these things were written to tr real living beings. And so when Paul says, I'm writing to you, like he does right here in verse 15 of chapter 4, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, he's talking to them, isn't he? Now this is important. Now, does that mean that by extension there are certain things that we can't extrapolate that there are for us as well? Sure there are. And the context makes that clear. The context also makes equally clear when the certain things cannot be extrapolated towards you, like for instance, you experiencing the second coming in your lifetime or somewhere out in the future of history yet to be. The New Testament won't allow for that. I just gave you Matthew 16, 27 and 28, didn't I? I just gave that to you. That some of you who are standing here, Jesus says to the group of people in front of him, disciples and other people, some of you who are standing here will not taste of death, will not die, till you see the Son of Man coming in power in his kingdom. That's one, just one aspect. Look at what he says in 15. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. We who are alive and remain. Who's that? Who is the we here? Would Paul not be including himself right here? We who are alive. That would be Paul, the Thessalonians, probably Silas, probably Silas and Timothy as Paul and Silas and Timothy are addressing themselves to these Thessalonians. And then including the Thessalonians themselves, we who are alive. And will what until the coming? Remain. Isn't that what it says? Look at your Bible, verse 15. We who are alive and remain until the coming will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died will experience a gathering. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but I will later. They will experience a gathering together. But he says, we who are alive and remain unto the coming. The word coming right there is, you guessed it, parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live and remain up to that. We who are alive. Now, it doesn't guarantee that Paul knows for sure that he himself is going to be alive when it happens. As a matter of fact, he will not be. But it will still be his same generation. He doesn't know that. But it's still his same generation. Where's he getting that from? He's getting that from Jesus. Because that's all Jesus ever said relative to the timing of his parousia, that it would take place within that first century. I have an entire teaching to give you in regards to just Jesus' teaching on the timing of his second coming. That teaching of, of itself, if you will treat it seriously, will completely turn you into a preterist. Oh my gosh, run, quick, bolt. And he repeats it again in verse 17, then we who are alive and remain, and then he talks about the seizing, the being catching together. E whatever your view is on the so-called seizing or the word rapture, which I don't like that, that word, it's not a biblical word. Uh, it's, it's from the Latin rapier, it means fast. You know. In any case, whatever your view is on that, isn't that interesting that two times in verse 15 and in verse 17, he uses the phrase, we who are alive and remain. Is he not expecting that? Did he not tell the Thessalonians in 1.10 that they were to wait for his son from heaven? Wait for God's son from heaven? Let me give you one more. And I think we'll probably stop for this uh, session. This is, this is, this is something. You're, you're probably thinking, gosh, I've read over these things so many times and I have not noticed these things before. Well, here's another one that you've probably read over and you haven't noticed this either. Uh, in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, in verse 23. 523. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. 
Then he says, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved, complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, coming right there is parousia, so it's the second coming word. It's his arrival with a consequential presence. Notice that, that spirit, soul, and body are preserved at the second coming. It's the same idea as up until, just like he said in 4.15. We who are alive and remain until the parousia of the Lord, right? But look at 5.23 right here. This is, a, this is amazing. He says, may your, middle of 23, may your spirit, soul, and what? Body be what? Preserved entirely or complete up until the parousia. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, this is not a resurrection passage. You can't turn this into a resurrection as if somehow preservation means resurrection. That's manipulation. Let's just get that off the plate right now. Just take the text. Let the text mean what it says. Paul is saying here that he wants their spirit, soul, and body, the whole person, to be preserved up to when? The second coming, the parousia. There's just no way around this, ladies and gentlemen. So here's your choice. You've got these Thessalonians ripe and in a cave somewhere, but they're preserved. These people are still alive. You got that, or you have what Jesus taught, that he was coming back in that first century during their lifetimes. I recommend you head in that direction because that's all the Bible is going to allow for. And it makes perfect sense since the Apostle Paul had already said to them in 1.10 that they were to wait for the Son of God from heaven. Just like they had been turned away from idols unto the living God, just like they had grabbed hold of the gospel. So they were told in the same way to wait for his Son from heaven. If the gospel was powerful to save them then, then that means on the same level that they were to expect the Son of God to come back for them because he's going to finish the salvation program. He's going to finish the salvation program to the exact same group that he left. Let me, let me say this to you, and then we'll stop. Maybe. Have you ever noticed in these parables that Jesus taught when he would be teaching a parable regarding uh, his second coming? He'd be teaching a parable about his second coming, and uh, a rich man would go away for a time, and then you know, he would give responsibilities to the servants, and then he would come back, right? He would come back. Uh, and then that there would be a, a time of judgment. The servants would be rewarded for what they did. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that in all of those parables that speak in that way, Jesus, we all know who Jesus is in these parables. He's the owner of the house or the rich man or something like that. That he always comes back to the exact same people that he left. He doesn't come back to another generation. He doesn't. He's not some superman who lives for two or three thousand years and comes back to a group of people that, you know, right? Why does he do that? Because Jesus is consistent. He is consistent in demonstrating that he's coming back to them at, in their generation. See, that's what he said. This genia, my contemporaries, this genia will not pass until all these things take place. Heaven and earth, the temple, will pass away. But what's eternal? My words will never pass away. So we've got quite a bit of work here to do, don't we? Quite a bit of work. Hope you enjoyed it. This is the first installment. This gives you a little introduction to the parousia. There are other passages where the Greek word parousia is used. Um, I could throw a few at you right now. You might want to write down James 5, verses 7 through 9. I'll return to these passages, by the way, for other reasons. But James 5, 7 through 9, parousia is used there. Also, 2 Peter 1, 16. 2 Peter 1, 16. Also, 2 Peter 3. Verse 4 and verse 12, use the word parousia. You could also make a note of 1 John 2.28. The second coming series, it's designed to do one thing and one thing only, to glorify God through a right understanding of his word, to stop error, this is one big thing, to stop error, and ladies and gentlemen, here's the big catch. Here's the big catch. This is why everybody in Christendom needs to be a preterist. You know why? 
Because if Jesus is here, then we need to start behaving like he is. Jesus said when he came back, there would be rulership. There would be reigning. He made promises in regards to that. Look at the promise to the, to the Thyatirans in that little epistle to the Thyatirans in Revelation, the second chapter. He quotes out of Psalm 2 and talks about the fact that those who overcome there in Thyatira, that would, they would sit with him on his throne and would rule, would rule with rods of iron. What does that mean today? Jesus comes back. And he passes out the rewards, and we are to be ruling and reigning with him. You know, in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, which talks about his second coming, and the Father handing the kingdom that will not cease over to him. And then verse 18, verse 22, and I believe it's verse 27 after that, all talk about how that the kingdom is then handed over to the saints, and the saints rule. Do you rule? Do you rule in this earth? Or is this earth ruling over you? There's a lot of things that could be said in regards to this. This demands that your expectations of what it means to be living in the kingdom, this demands that they be revised rapidly. And that you start living like you're in the kingdom instead of being a subject of slavery to the rule of men. There's something to this. This spiritual ruling and reigning. No, I am not advocating overthrowing the government. No, I am advocating taking your place, your rightful place. Remember when, we'll end with this, promise. Remember when Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you? Topos, an office of responsibility. Living like he is here is a part of that responsibility. And you know what? You know what? You want to see the United States turn en masse to Christ Jesus as King of Kings? Just let the church start embracing the biblical understanding of the parousia, the presence of Christ here on this earth. Just let them start embracing that and they'll start behaving like it's true. The boss is here. You don't run and look busy. You start taking over like he said to, spiritually speaking. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your blessing and grace to be strong upon all these people who have heard this teaching. I ask that they would be encouraged and, Lord, that they would join us again for further studies in this subject. In the name of Jesus, amen.